Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Conversational Witchcraft with me, Dawn the Kitchen Witch. Um, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, hit all the bells and the whistles so that uh, when we have amazing guests on, like we have today, you get the info first. So today, really cool, we've got Ben Stimson. Ben Stimson is a therapist, a lecturer, a student, and a spiritual director. Ben has developed courses on a variety of topics, including ancestor, veneration, the power of story, and folklore. And when not working with clients or writing, Ben is engaged with his areas of study, religious studies, medieval and classical studies, folklore, and spirituality. Ben's own personal spiritual background includes Hinduism, neo-paganism, Lakumi, which I'm sure I mispronounced, uh, oh, Druid. <laughs> I didn't, I said it right. No, uh, you said Druidry it right. Druidry <laughs> and folk tradition. Ben, welcome to the show. I'm so glad Hello. I didn't butcher that. Oh, you did perfect. That's perfect. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been really, really looking forward to this interview. Thanks. Thanks. I'm excited. I love meeting new friends. And um, before we hit all the recording buttons, we were already like, getting on very well and i was like well, we gotta hit the buttons so we gotta we gotta make yes, sure just fake his smile right now yeah fake it fake this one i don't i don't i'm not good at that <laughs> i have i have no poker face when i don't like someone i'm like uh-huh yep and so you can always tell that i'm <laughs> okay so i'm doing good okay good <laughs> totally totally spectacular thank you so much for being here now you are up in canada is that correct I am, yes. So when this eventually comes out, I'll still be in Canada. Um, but later in the year, I'm actually going to be reloc relocating to the UK. So I'm currently in Canada, but by hopefully next summer, um, 2024, I'll be in the UK. And I was in Canada last week. So when we're reporting this in the summer, but I was in Montreal last week. It was my first time oh. ever. And it was, it was so amazing. It was so beautiful not to, yeah. not, not to diverge, but you're actually from the UK. I am. And then you I'm originally from the UK. And now yeah. you're going back. And now I'm going back. And what's that yeah. about? Are you just um, too well, close to America? Because we kind of suck right now. <laughs> Don't send me no, letters, people. Um... Don't send me letters. <laughs> we do kind of. No, suck. it's it's okay. it's been a oh, well. Well, that's. I mean, it, we're, Canada is starting to become like the states in that way, but um, it's not quite the states in that way. Certain parts of the states, you know. Um, I I'll be honest with you. I, I I so I moved over here when I was eight years old. And I yeah. went back and I worked over there about 12 years ago um, for a, an extended six month period. And I loved it. And it just felt yeah. like home. And uh, it ties in with the ancestor work that we'll talk about today. But um, it's actually becoming very expensive in Ontario. I, I live a few hours from Toronto, um, but it's, um, it's becoming really expensive to live cost of living is just insane up here so it just makes more sense and i'm a citizen so i can easily move over as opposed to going through a whole immigration process again so um, lots of reasons yeah that's so great to have the dual citizenship and be able to bounce back and forth when you want to you know but you grew up mm. in canada I did. I grew up in Canada, so I've been heavily connecting with um, people of the community over there, trying to make friends, and uh, and and like every so often having like, good discussions around what it will be like. I have no doubt I'm going to have some culture shock, but having gone there about ten years ago and 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 worked over there um, for six months, I got a really good taste of what it was like at least ten years ago. Yeah. So it's. Um, but I, I grew up with British culture in the home, so I kind of I I now always feel like I'm in between somewhere I don't have that transatlantic accent though so <laughs> <laughs> right so you I still as if I really wanted to <laughs> yeah you still sound like you're from the UK but you were raised in yeah. Canada mostly but that had yeah. to be really hard is that what you said you were eight when you moved yeah and eight that's and a half not, years old it's not like moving to another town or like even you know when I was when I was really little when I was um five there was the girl who was my best friend and she moved from uh, Virginia to New York, which is where I grew up. Right. And then when we were 10, she moved from New York to New Hampshire, which is where I live now. Um, but that's not, and that was hard enough. You know, I mean, we were little kids, she was little and she moved from New York to New Hampshire. Uh, you know, it's, it's the same, you know, that had to be really, really difficult as, as a child. Yeah. 
you know? Uh, yeah, I'll be honest. I, I didn't realize it until a few years ago how much it fucked me up. And I'll, like, I, I'm very open about that. I talk about that in the book. Yeah. Um, but what I, I dealt with was culture shock. I was old enough to still remember back home. And when I came over here, I was suddenly, imagine this. I, I grew up in the UK. I was surrounded by all the people who sounded like me, acted like me. And although I had uh, a learning disability and, and I needed to do speech therapy and I sound a little bit different because I had a lisp back then, um, it was totally normalized. People just, I was at home. And then I suddenly come over here and I'm different, right? And that being different just compounded because, you know, I came over here, I sounded different. I was a foreign kid. I didn't eat the same food at home and I was right. weird. And then I was, I discovered I was gay. Then I discovered I'm like interested in witchcraft. And then it just got weirder and weirder. And weirder. So, um, <laughs> you know, it was yeah. one of those, but it was culture shock and it caused a lot of, a great deal of issues in my life. And I only really resolved that in therapy a few years ago and understood and put that all into context. And uh, yeah, it was difficult. Wow. Was that part of why you decided, because in your professional life, you're also a therapist, a counselor, like, yeah, yes. you know, mm -hmm. you, you're there helping people kind of deal with those same sort of things. Was that something, were those early experiences, what drove you into that line of profession? I think so. I think so. Originally I was training to be a social worker mm -hmm. and uh, I moved to Toronto from growing up. And I mean, it wasn't, what made it even worse was I moved from a tiny little village in the UK where I had grown up with everybody and everybody was familiar yeah. to a tiny little village over here in Canada where nobody was familiar. Everyone was related except me. I didn't have any family, all of that. Right. I know. Right. Wow. So um, I, uh, so I originally was, I, I moved to Toronto and uh, I chose to study social work and I just, and social work just burnt me out because I just couldn't, I couldn't help in the way that I felt like I wanted to. And of course, being part of a queer community too, there's a big drive in, when you have that experience of wanting to help others because you yourself were rejected and all of these things, right? So um, I, I think so. Eventually what led me to, to therapy work and psychotherapy work was spirituality, actually. Um, the training program I did with, uh, with um, the psychotherapy program I did in Toronto was spiritual psychotherapy. And so it really brought in all of these pieces that I had been working in my private life into a professional career. And, uh, and so that's where the power of story comes in. That's where ancestral work comes in. Um, I often like to say my book is just, you know, 250 pages pages of a therapy session between you and your ancestors. I love it. But it so is much. true. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I like that so. I, I'm always I'm very fascinated by the links between um you know therapy, neuroscience, witchcraft, magical working, energy working, because the, the the connective tissue between these things, once Absolutely. you know it's there, is impossible Absolutely. not to see, you know, and, mm -hmm. and not to connect those dots. Um, so I really, I love talking to people that are pagans and witches that really get the therapy aspect of things that really understand mental health is a real thing, you yes. know? Um, so, so you're a kid and you're growing up in Canada and you're missing your home and you're, you're obviously dealing with all those little kid things that we don't realize until we, until we get older. And they're like, Oh, wow, I was really fucked up by that. Um, <laughs> like that, that friend I told you about that moved when we were little, like I was literally, I stopped talking. I was 10 years old. I stopped talking. I didn't want to do yes. anything. I didn't want to go. It, I was really, really yeah. traumatized. And as a little kid going, starting to go to, to see a therapist didn't work out so good at that time, yeah. but it was one of those, um, those things where you realize after the fact, you're like, oh, I can literally pinpoint these moments that really fucked me yeah. up as a kid, yeah. right? In so, retrospect, right? right? Yeah, hindsight is, is 20, 20 yeah. So at what point during this journey did you find witchcraft and energy work? Well, it's it's interesting because I um so so I'm 36 years old. That's very important for this conversation. I'm 36 <laughs> years old, and so I was just turning into like a teenager around the year 2000. So uh, 2000, I'd been in Canada for five years. I was just coming to terms with my sexuality. 9/11 mm -hmm. happened in 2001, right? Again, very important for this conversation. Um, so there was a, a, a suddenly a space in the culture where um, not only was I feeling ungrounded and unsure of where I was, suddenly the rest of the culture was. And anyone who grew up or was um, 
um, who was uh, able to understand what was happening at, in 2001 can understand that suddenly the Western world didn't feel as secure. And although I didn't understand that back then, I was like, there was something about what was happening around me in the culture that really then like it, it gave me shocks. So I, um, I, I started to look for roots. And one of the big things with kind of moving from any country is that, you know, all of those cultural pieces, um, all of those cultural pieces that we don't think we would miss or that we aren't even aware of, suddenly you really miss because, you know, it's not there anymore. So I started latching on to anything I could that was British. Mm -hmm. So I started watching like Absolutely Fabulous when I was like in the UK. And I remember like watching Patsy and Adina do their thing. And as a, a young pre-understanding he was a gay kid, that was like, you know, drag queen and what, right? It was right. amazing. Um, right. But like, you know, all the old comedies, my parents still watch British television. Yeah. Ontario still had a lot of British television on the public um, uh, television like they did with PBS, right? Yeah. So I still had content, but it wasn't enough. And and, um, and I, I, I remember always being captivated. Where I'm from in in in, uh, in the UK is North Wales, and that's quite close to where Mara Starling and Christopher Hughes and like a lot of the of the of the British writers are right now. And that is such a magical landscape. It's like any kind of old old European place. It has that that folklore that's still there, and the stories of the fairies and whatnot. Yes. And, and I remember we had a load of books um, on on folklore um, in the house. So I became really interested in fairies and fantasy. I think also partly as an escape. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I remember sure. growing up on Dragonlance and fantasy books and Lord of the Rings and all yes. that, and being captivated. Right. I think this yes. is a, a common thing for any of the witch folk. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so from there, I then discovered the Mists of Avalon. I mean, mm. Mists of Avalon. Uh, originally, I didn't read the book, but I watched the TV show, uh, the the little movie that they put together. Yeah, it was like a, I remember exactly what you're talking about. It was like a, like a mini series. It was like a three a part mini series, yeah. or something. and it was fantastic. I loved it. it was I loved so it. Good. It was amazing. Yes, and, and so, like, uh, two thousand one that came out in two thousand one, uh, like all of these things converged, and uh, and I was at the point where I was starting to understand that I didn't feel comfortable, or I was being rejected by the Christianity in my small town. My small town, there was eight thousand people, eighteen different churches, eighteen different denominations, and none of them seemed to want me. So I was this little case, like it, it, uh, convergence of all things we also got the internet around that time which was huge so suddenly i got online wow i was watching the mists of avalon i was like oh goddess worship what is this um i was google. able to get a copy before of uh, google, google right? exactly before google. oh alta vista yes. alta vista dog pile yes ask jeeves right yes. ask and jeeves. i got on <laughs> ask jeeves, jeeves. yes, yes. <laughs> goddess you know. of avalon clickety click goddess of avalon yes and then and then dial yep. up yeah 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 yeah. yes yeah. well and and it and so so then i came across wicca like it was internet popular yeah. 90s wicca but i got onto witch fox i got onto all of these like i know witch fox right blast from the past see 36 36 becomes very important in this conversation yes. but um but so from there then I started to explore this idea of of spirituality and witchcraft as something that I could take on. I also watched the craft. I watched, you know, all these like classic things, right? I love. I'm, I'm a little me. older, quite older than you, and I love that you referred to the craft as classic because um, that's, you know, that was we we all wanted to be those girls, and I remember, I remember being like 18 years old and finding my path. And, and, you know, oh, my very yes. first book was uh, to ride a silver broomstick and it's a very, very common. Right. And I remember having conversations and telling people, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a witch or I'm a pagan. And they'd be like, I'm a witch too. I watched the craft like 17 times <laughs> and I do candle magic. And I'm like, mm, love it. Mm. I love it. I yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But it's interesting, right? Because you made a point of saying, like, you know, getting so into these fantasy stories and magic in 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 stories and media. And yes, as a way of an escapism, but you know, there's all kinds of things that are escapist, right? You know, action Absolutely. movies, sports, these are escapes, mm. these are entertainments, but witches tend to 
it we was tend a to more gravitate towards, and then we go, hmm. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I wonder. I wonder. Okay, so you're you're a young man. You're you're you know 18, 19 years old. You're just discovering which. Oh, you even earlier than that, even, 13, even, 14. Wow. Yeah, I, I turned twelve in two thousand. So I was 13, 14 so around like, the time I was starting to, yeah, really young. Wow. Yeah. yeah wow. Really Sorry, young. I didn't do the math there. I know you've said. No, it's okay. No, 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 no. It's okay. <laughs> How did your, were your yeah. parents very traditional and not, I mean, you're here in this really Christian community mm. in Canada, yeah. right? But I, my impression, and I could be wrong, so please mm. stop me if I am, is that the UK is a lot more, um, like you said, it's steeped in these traditions, right? So it's when you steeped, say something yes. like, if you're like, oh, I was out in the field and I was playing with the fairies, even if you're a 40 year old <laughs> woman, people will be like, yeah, I get that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah. If, they, if you, they saw you walking down the street with a bowl of milk and honey and mm. they, and you said, oh, it's my offering for the fairies. They'd be like, yeah, okay, mm -hmm, go on. You know, yeah. in America, that's not the case. People look at you like you're nuts. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't know if that's the case in Canada, but what were your parents like on board with like, oh, our kid is really into this stuff and eh, it's nothing. He's just crazy or yeah, yeah, we get it. Well, so, so British culture is very, it's very strange when it comes to religion, because I'd say like, I mean, we've had, we had a civil war around around religion yeah. right? in a way yeah. that was a lot like it really set the stage for a secularism yeah. um so the, the uk is very ambivalent when it comes to i would say generally a very ambivalent when it comes to religion when it comes to um kind of outward showing of religion because mm. you know we culturally we've had such a, a, a um a dangerous dynamic between protestants and catholics yeah. that i think uh, religion in general is very much a we don't talk about that do that in your home or the the the, the parts of the religion the anglicanism church of england particularly that is very um kind of foundational and societal and out there institutional is the word i should say mm -hmm. um is just seen as a part of the culture like my parents are those kind of anglicans and my 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 mum was never baptized i was never baptized mm -hmm. but they're the type of people who would have only gone to church for you know christenings or weddings or funerals right. um right. and and even then funerals were like that right depending on if they liked the person or not right, right. so I, they didn't I, I don't and, and even now I don't think my parents understand religion they don't understand yeah. why somebody would be so interested in that because yeah. they're, they're, they're working class their focus is more on kind of surviving and you know yeah. like you know perpetuating um, that sort of thing that being said I think in the Catholic community in England and, and the UK I think there's a lot more religiosity but that's because of identity um you know being a catholic is not a religious thing it's a religious identity um it's mm. a community it's it's so much more than anglicanism is because anglicanism is just like you know the, the connection between being english and being anglican has been set in stone for 300 years now right. that it, there's no there's a no there's no blur there's a lot of blurring between those things right, right. so they didn't quite understand why i was interested i think they still don't understand why I'm interested in spirituality. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I think there's a swinging the other side. I think there's a lot more people who are interested in alternative forms of spirituality and and even like in folk um, folk um, uh, religion and folk uh, Catholicism, there's a lot of interest. I've, I'm noticing, anyways, in the witchcraft community to reclaiming um, Christian working with saints and yes. the folk elements of of of, of Christianity as a part of a kind of an, uh, an identity, a social identity. There's I, a lot I of things around that. I would yeah. have to agree with that for sure. And I think that you've, you hit a couple of really important points there. The first being the difference between religion and spirituality, right? Because uh, yes, um, I would say I'm a witch or I'm a pagan in terms of my religion, but I don't think about it as religion. I think about it at, cause to me, religion is organized right yes. it you mm -hmm. have you have somebody telling you the rules and you have to follow this doctrine and you know it stand up sit down stand up sit down you know 
eat the cookie, drink the wine, you know, right. that's, that's the world. That's the world I grew up in. So, so for me, that's religion. Being a pagan, being a witch is more of a spiritual practice. Um, for me, I don't want to, I don't want to say that that is correct for everyone, but that is for me. And I, I definitely think that there is a, the the very tip of the iceberg of, like you said, reclaiming some of those folk traditions, because there is folk tradition, folk magic, as we would, as we would call it little yes. things like, um, you know, Malokia. let's talk about Malokia. Things like that, right? Like we would, we would do these. I mean, as as an Italian person who grew up in New York with a little old Italian grandmother, she would sit in the dark with her rosary beads. Right. Do you know what I mean? And she would, yeah. she would have to do the the, the cycle. And I don't, mm. I don't think that that's coming down from the religious organization. I think that tradition of you know, this is my daily affirmation. This is my daily prayer. Very this is so. my daily yeah. ritual, you know, um, you know, little things like, you know, spitting on people for good luck. That's, that's right. you know, that's folk tradition that you do. You are seeing those things now getting passed around or, or being like, Oh, Hey, yeah, no, my, my little old great grandmother used to do this thing, yes. and, you know, um, whether it was Catholic or, or whatever, um, there is a resurgence of that for sure. Um, totally. I hope, I, I hope that's happening a lot here. I, I think so. I, I think so. I was having this conversation with, um, well, on another podcast and also with a few friends of mine, we were talking about um, kind of what we notice when there's social instability. What we tend to notice is people tend to gravitate towards what, what is going to ground us, right? During the pandemic, mm -hmm. the reason that people went out and like mass bought silly things like $700 worth of toilet paper is because seeing that thing helped to ground them right it came from a fear place i think that a lot of these older traditions and um and i noticed this when people are uh, a lot of traditional witchcraft folk or, or folkloric witches when you really ask them they tend to have had a history of being interested in african traditional religions mm. or other forms of extant traditions that, that that seem to have a very solid foundational piece and what often happens is then people will look at their own cultural traditions or their own background traditions and 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 tease out those traditions or resurface them in order to form groundings so i think that over the past 10 years at least that's what i've been seeing um is that we have social instability we have a, a large generation of people who are not sure about the future and so yeah. what are we looking we're looking at the past right we're reclaiming that past for ourselves myself like i'm not a christian but i have to be honest i really love 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 catholicism and and anglicanism and I have that in my ancestral um, tradition. That's part yeah. of my ancestral tradition, you know. And so yeah. to plug into that isn't necessarily because I'm, you know, wanting to, you know, suddenly become a Jesus freak. Right. Um, but it's because that has been a container for the culture that has now led to my experience. So I think that in many ways, we're looking more at the container to tease out and find our story in that than necessarily the evangelical, like, you know, on my knees, because I only yeah. go on my knees for certain people, right? I so. agree. I agree. There's, yeah, you know, and, and yeah. only on very special occasions. Um, I, I want you to uh, really... I want people listening to really think about what you said about um, when people are in uncertain times yes. that we gravitate towards things that ground us. And as you're talking about that, all I was thinking was as a kitchen witch, right? All I was thinking about was through the pandemic, how the big thing was bread making. Yes. Yes. Right. Like, I love that. Right. Everybody is making right. bread. Everybody's learning how to do sourdough starters. Everybody's yes. baking. And then it was, okay, well, what else? What was the, what was the huge trend uh, that people were watching was British baking show, right? Yes. Uh, bake off. Everybody's watching bake off, bringing us to these traditions that are around home, family, nurturing. That is folk magic right Very how much to so. and now there's a if you if you're anywhere online and you're looking at any of these things you're seeing 
very young people getting into homesteading, getting into canning, yes. growing their own food, mm -hmm. you know, um, really connecting with the land, really connecting with mother earth, the cycles, nature, the, the, the seasons, right. These yeah. are folk practices and magical practices and energetic practices that ground us in the here and now, yes. and also psycho psychologically allow us to feel a sense of control of our own space and our, of our own exactly. life. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah, right. That sense of control. Yeah. Right. So we do these things as spiritual beings, but also as and energetic beings, but also as human beings with mental health and, and, and needs, you know, emotional yeah. needs. And when we can marry the two, we're kind of creating balance in our mental health yes. and our spiritual health. And I, I think you hit on that so beautifully in explaining why people mm. go to these practices that ground them. And that's why we're seeing this resurgence, you know, over the last mm. decade, as you said, I mean, even since 9-11, upheaval in our world has just i mean it's it's growing and growing and growing it's it's constantly mm -hmm. multiplying and the pandemic and you know like you were talking about how all of these pieces all yeah. of these pieces what can we do as individuals mm -hmm. is to come back to ourselves come back to our heritages yes. come back to these practices that allow us to find peace and control in our own lives, right? And mm -hmm. how do we do that? We work with lineage in the past. We work with ancestors. We tap into our roots, which are deep yes. and wide, right? Very much so. Ancestor Very magic. Much so. Ancestor Very magic. much so. So, but I would also take that a step further because we aren't just tapping into these traditions and taking them just by rote, we're making them a part of ourselves. We are expanding them to include us and we're finding ourselves in this. I, um, I, I was actually yes. criticized recently because when somebody looked at my guest list for my own podcast, all they saw were either uh, a lot of men and a lot of white people. And uh, and fair, that, that's a fair assessment. But they, were say, they said, but you don't have a lot of women. And what the focus of my podcast is, is actually queer identity. And so the vast majority of my, of my um, practitioners who will come on and, and guests who come on are all queer of various different identities. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to see then how we even view the community that we're part of, the witchy community, through mm -hmm. that lens of self. And it makes total sense. I, I sat back and I was thinking, okay, how am I going to respond to this? I decided not to respond to it just because, um, uh, you know, you can't respond to everything. But I sat back and, I, okay, where is this coming from? Okay, this individual appears to connect with witchcraft through her femininity, through her female identity, through wow. her her experience as a woman, right? Wow. Which makes total sense for her age range. She seemed a little bit older. So I was making assumptions here. They may have been completely wrong. But one of the reasons that witchcraft became so popular in the 1970s and 80s was the goddess women's movement, yeah. right? Totally makes sense. Yeah. The vast majority of the like queer practitioners and there seems to be a connection between folkloric witches and queerness. And uh, so a lot of the writers that I'm seeing are all, all tend to be on the queer spectrum somewhere, right? It's it's weird. It's something. I'm, I'm looking into it a little bit more. I it, want to there, understand it's that definitely myself. something. I've had people criticize my right. podcast as well and say, how come yeah. all the men you have on are queer men? And I'm like, mm. I don't, I don't know. I, they're good. I've, yeah. I'm not trying to have you know, specifically queer men yeah. on, but give me, if you want me to have a straight man on that talks find about witchcraft, <laughs> find me a straight man that talks yes. about witchcraft. You know, I, right. there's a couple, there's a handful, you know, there's a couple, um, but, yeah. I, you know, I'm, but I'm over here going, I don't care. I don't care who you are. If you've got something interesting to talk about, let's talk about it. I, you know, so I'm not, I didn't even think, oh, should that be, should I, should I, Should be, I be? I, well, that's the thing, right? Yeah. I, I sat back and looked at my own and I was thinking about this. But the reason I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. There's a recurring theme among all of the guests that I've had on. People like uh, Matt Oren, Devin Hunter, Nicholas yeah. Pearson, Craig Spencer, yeah. all of like the whole the whole pantheon, right? Yeah. All the people you've had on too. Yeah. What are they saying? 
they all watched Buffy in the night. Like they're all of the same age range. They all watched Buffy and the Craft when they were younger. Yes. They all, you know, gravitated towards the strong female writers like yes. Silver Raven Wolf. And what did they not find? queer identity in that they didn't see gay writers so they've become that right Right. so it's interesting we 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 take these traditions but we expand them to include us we find ourselves in it and i think that's for multiple different personalities and and different kind of backgrounds right i love that so much fascinating the identity that we bring to our own witchcraft and and something you said at the very beginning about you know the stories we tell yes, because of the stories of who we are. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to see the world through any lens, but your own, because you only have your own experience. You have you only have your own lens. Exactly. Right, exactly. So this kind of brings us right into everything about your book, uh, Ancestral Whispers. And so we're going to take a quick break hear from our amazing sponsors. And then we come back, we're going to take a deep dive into your most recent work. Okay. We'll be right back with the amazing Ben Stimson. Do you need a break, my friend? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. Welcome back to Conversational Witchcraft. It's me, Dawn the Kitchen Witch, chatting with Ben Stimson today. Okay, so right before the break, we were talking about, you know, uh, seeing the world through our own lens, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell others in our own witchcraft and and magical and energetic practices, which brings us to your new book, uh, Ancestral Whispers. So it's awesome. And this book, uh, we're recording this before it publishes, but it's going to be available when this airs. So uh, it's very exciting. Um, One of the things that's really cool about this book is that um, even though we're talking about witchy, witchy stuff and paganism and stuff like that, it's written um, in a tradition, non-specific way. Yes. Yes. Right. So it doesn't matter what you practice or how you identify religiously or spiritually, Mm -hmm. you can get into this. Why was that important for you? It was important for me because, because of the diversity of my spiritual background, right? I have been blessed with being able to be an insider or somewhat of an insider to many different traditions. And uh, with, like with Lukumi, for example, although I didn't initiate into Lukumi, uh, Lukumi is Santeria for those who know it through that name. Um, foundationally, ancestral work is so important to that tradition. It is something that anybody who is starting to become involved in it is is not only pressured to do, but it's it's foundational. You have to do it. The ancestors become um, the the literally the ground that we walk the rest of our journey on. That's the the imagery, and uh, but a lot of the rituals are connected to the uh, the ancestors of that tribe. And initiation into any African tradition is literally seen as initiation into the tribe. You take on the ancestors of that of that community, um, as well as your own ancestors. And um, and so you know, I, I, I as somebody who has a British background, um, who's really connected with British heritage and and my ancestors over there, because I didn't have connection to them physically, or or I only could meet them through story, because being over here, um, I started to think, okay, well, what do what can I do for my ancestors? right how how am i going to bring this in and i feel like at least when i started writing this i noticed that a lot of people talking about ancestral veneration they'd watched the movie coco they'd you know they had been gravitating towards writers who were talking about right. ancestor work from a, a a bipoc perspective they didn't know how to work with their own ancestors without appropriating. And so what was important for me with this book was to give a roadmap, like a therapy session. This is a therapy session. It's a couple's counseling between you and your ancestors. Um, And it's asking the the important questions. It's asking the important questions that then anybody can develop a relationship in an authentic, non-appropriative way. And I go into why that's important to not appropriate. It really is important. important. Now, that being said, I think that there's also, um, there's a, and don't come at me, don't send me emails, but I've noticed. It's just a conversation. uh, It's just a conversation. But I have noticed that a lot of particularly white or or, or Caucasian um, background individuals in North America and other settled um, countries, 
they tend to see ancestor work as only a BIPOC thing. And so then they only go to see BIPOC. Uh, they only gravitate towards BIPOC spaces to see what they can take with them. And, uh, and so I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think there's a lot of reasons connected to like the funeral, the funeral industry that has really disconnected Westerners from the idea of death and from the idea of connecting with the ancestors. I think that it also comes to religious trauma, particularly with ancestors who are Christian, right? You suddenly wow. have this situation where you have witches and neo-pagans and people who have come from Christianity with religious trauma suddenly there's this disconnect well how am i going to work with all these christian ancestors if i'm not christian anymore and i don't believe in that but they did how am i going to work with that so what often happens is we then look at oh my pagan ancestors oh my ancestors were pagans my ancestors were unbroken line of witches going back blah 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 however long it goes it goes back to that idea of story and narrative but that story and narrative comes back to then emphasizing our own personal identities right wow so do you, do you know what i mean like yeah. having me said that have you seen that as well you know i i definitely um you know as a as a caucasian woman in her 40s um I definitely <laughs> feel often like oh that practice isn't for me or this practice isn't for me um and definitely i, I you you struck a chord with me when you said there's a disconnect with working with the ancestors when you identify as pagan or a witch, but your ancestors are all Catholic. Like there's still shame for me going, oh, maybe my Ooh. grandma wouldn't, she wouldn't want me to be doing this. So maybe I, right. maybe I shouldn't do it, you know? But I do mm -hmm. think, I do think there are things that we do that are ancestral magic. Yes. That we don't realize that they are. Mm -hmm. And for me in my practice with, you know, primarily kitchen witchcraft it's very alive all the time of course right of course so i mean mm -hmm. in in the magical tools that i use in terms of you know yeah. things that i have that are actually passed down that are Absolutely. you know pots and pans and spoons and things like that um and then i can stay connected you know but there are things that i don't do right that i'm not connected with and at the very beginning, mm -hmm. before we even hit record, I had said to you, you know, I'm really interested in your work because ancestral magic is something that outside of the kitchen, I have a really hard time with. I was estranged from my father's family. I know very, very little about their background. And uh, I don't know much about um, on my mother's side and my maternal side. I know a little tiny bit, but my grandmother never talked about Italy. She never talked about it. So I don't know right. what happened. You know, um, I know very little. Um, so my relationship with them isn't fabulous. And the work I do doesn't leave my kitchen. Right. Right. So right. it's it's really interesting to me to hear you talk about this in a non in non-tradition specific way, right? Because I would love to learn other ways to connect that aren't going to offend my ancestors. Right. Right. What about that? Like, are people concerned about offending their ancestors? I, I, I would say so. I would say so. I think that there's definitely that perception of offending ancestors. You said something very, very critical just then. You said, I want to learn ways to connect. I'm going to challenge that and say that you actually already know ways to connect. It's the, do I have permission to do it? Right. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it does. Yeah, um, right? Yeah, and, and, and the searching. I think there's a searching yes. element as well. I had, um, I had another person on maybe last year um, who wrote a, an ancestral book and she does some, some healing through, through ancestral work. And I had this similar conversation and I said, yeah, you know, I don't really, I don't really know who they were. And she goes, oh, they know you. And I was like, so, uh, it's true. I was like, fuck. Yeah, I know. <laughs> fuck. Fuck. Right. Did they? And she's like, oh yeah, they know yeah. who you are. And I was like, oh, mother. all right, crap. You know, like what does a lot of that come through for you? Like now that you're 
so let's get back. Let's get back to you because I'm. I'm. We're not going to talk about my ancestors. Of course, much. of course, of course. There's Sorry, I, it's turning into a therapy session here. Sorry. I know exactly, <laughs> and I will ride that yeah. train. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so how? Where did you find that connection back well, to your ancestors? Mm -hmm. Well, so so my connection with my ancestors has always been a, a true story. They've like because when I left, like when my grandmother, who I was closest to, passed away, I wasn't allowed to at her funeral because I was five years old. My parents, particularly my dad, said no because he had to go through a funeral when he was a child, oh. and it was traumatic for him. Yeah. So death, I've never actually been at a family funeral at all. And when I moved over here, we never went to over and visited. There was issues. There were big issues with yes. that. But yes. um, so so for me, the, my ancestors have always been up here, and through the stories that my mom has been telling me and my dad has been telling me, and through pictures, right, and the memories that I have, I feel lucky that I have memories of of some of those individuals. My yeah. younger brother doesn't; he was too yeah. young. So that connection was was always there. Like I have vivid memories of staying with my grandma, my one grandmother. What the key, I think the key piece for me was when I actually had to do as part of my psychotherapy program, um, I had to actually go and do a family research project, which was huge. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful thing to do, and uh, and what 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 really clinched it for me was it wasn't just a family research project. Um, it was something called a genogram, which is a very particular form. It's it's a tool that's used by social workers and doctors. What it does is it doesn't just look at family, uh, like like who they were and where they were born when they were married. What it does is it tracks family patterns. It tracks relationships. It tracks any kind of medical information that you can find out. It yeah. tracks um, issues like alcoholism, workaholism, and whatnot. So those were the lenses that I was bringing to researching my family. And you, I had to go back five generations. And what was fascinating was when you start to think about it, your family in that way, you start with yourself and move backwards to find the sources of things that you grew up with. So in my family, you know, there was alcoholism, there was workaholism, um, because my parents were both self-employed. That's a very important part of our family story. They both came over here, they started a business, and, uh, and they were very stressed out because of that, and it created issues. When I actually started to know to ask the right questions, suddenly I was able to start to make deductions of, okay, so on both sides of my family, workaholism is a big thing. Both my grandparents, both my grandfathers were plumbers. Both of their um, fathers were plumbers. Both of their grandfathers were self-made individuals and so on and so on. And when I actually looked at the history then, um, I got onto Ancestry.com. I figured out that both sides of the family, both great, great, great grandfathers were in the workhouse. And the workhouse was this horrific um, debtor's prison, basically, yeah. back in the 1800s, right? So it made sense. Okay. So we have this situation of a trauma six generations back where suddenly class was just compounding onto these individuals, making them feel morally corrupt and inept because they were poor, right? right. So what's the alternative to that? Okay, well, you become self-made people. You gain that power through building yourself up. Both of them then apprenticed, um, or, or their children apprenticed, and then they became, they took on a trade in this and so wow. So suddenly I have this story of my family on both sides. It makes total sense that my parents would gravitate towards each other and then lead to me. Wow. Right, I know. Holy so what, shit! <laughs> it was to to as as a form of therapy for myself because this is now a tool that I use for my own clients. Yeah, um, it was powerful. But then I also had the spiritual element in it. Yes, I also I was under I was living uh, while I was doing my psychotherapy program. I was living with my godfather at the time, who was a, a, a crowned priest of Oshun, and we have or they they have divination techniques that they can contact the dead directly. I was also involved with a couple of other people. I sat at dumb supper um, and was able to speak to my grandfather to verify some of these details. So I had the spiritual side and I had the kind of the physical evidence side um, and they spookily married together. So that helped me to develop then a relationship with these people um, and, and also understand that they are now, they are present in the world around me now. 
That's the other thing I, I, I really want to stress with this is that we often think of ancestors as, as dwelling in the past. No, they lived in the past. They right. dwell here and now, right? right. And right. if they dwell here now, just like, you know, versions of us existed in the past as well, but we're different from them. Just like when the, the dead, when they were living, were in the past, there is, a, a, at least this is my own perspective, um, they have that capacity to grow and be in the present now with us. So I was able to work some stuff out with my grandfather. Wow. Who, there was some stuff. It was amazing. It was amazing. Wow. So it was really important as I was writing that, that then this came into this work because that was my journey. That was my journey with my ancestors. I was able to develop my, my practice to, re to, to reflect my relationship with them and build on that relationship. That's really what my ancestral practice is all about. Right? Continuing to build on a relationship with those ancestors That's exactly and, and it. how yeah. that informs, as you said before, your identity and how you tell yes. the story to yourself and how the story reflects back at who you exactly. are. Exactly. Exactly. That's incredible. I'm sure people ask you tons of questions about this type of work. Is there something we should be talking about that we're not? Um, I would say, yes. So the biggest piece is that ancestor work, like, I feel like a lot of people think in witchcraft that ancestor work is magic, that ancestral magic is the most important bit. And I think that's, I think that there's, a, there's good reasons why that is. And I know you've brought that up today. You've been referencing that today. But what if it's just ancestral relationship in the same way that mm. deity work is deity relationship or spirit relationship? Then the magic is really just what you do, right? It it's isn't a focus. Result. It's just part of it. Exactly. Right, right. Right. I'll give you a very good example. Right. So I know it's a common meme going around that, you know, Italian housewives, they just pour until their known as spirit tells them to stop. Right. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right. You what? have to have that relationship with your known <laughs> beforehand in order to feel that like, no, stop child, stop. Right. The relationship is there. That just beforehand. made me feel like, you said oh. that and I just was like, oh, you just, oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Right. You no, have no, to no, have no, no, that relationship, okay. right? That you stop, child, stop. And I literally just felt like, oh. yeah. yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. Sorry, Ben. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. That's that's the thing. That's that's the thing, right? Amazing. But you already have that relationship with your Nona, and even if you don't necessarily know who they are, I think that guest before is very important. They they said they know you, because, and I'll extend expand on that. Yes. We can only know the people whose names are written down and whose stories are still being told. But what about all of those ancestors that existed before that? Right now, not knowing who they were doesn't mean that you can't know anything about them because the context that we live in now was created by all of those ancestors. Right, and you when you look at genealogy, that. that's amazing. Of course, well, so the the world that we live in, the world that we we live in today, was created ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, and so forth. Right, we create the context of our tomorrow just in the same way that our ancestors created the context for us to come in. Right, some things we're living with socially, the origins of them are actually thousands of years ago. True. Some of them are just a year ago. Right. True. So we're still living with that context. There's also that other piece of, you know, um, the vast majority of people in our ancestral lines um, are, are not going to be known to us. But when you look at the way that genealogy works, eventually you get to a point after so many generations that so many of your ancestors, if you're from a particular place, existed in that place, but the history then of that community was the history of enough of them that it was your family history. So if you think wow. two grandfathers, uh, two, gra two grandparents, the two parents, four gr uh, grandparents, eight great, 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 
grandparents and so on and so on. By the time you get to 10 generations back, you're looking at millions of ancestors. Now, right. eventually what happens is there's something called genealogical breakdown because you get to a ridiculous amount of people that can't possibly have all existed at the same time. Right. So you get multiple, you get individuals then appearing multiple times in your ancestral tree, especially when you know that you're from a, like your background is from a particular area. And so eventually your story, your family story becomes the story of that whole village, that whole region, that whole country. Wow. The further back you go. So you may not know your own family line, but you know, like if we go back 500 years, there are enough of my personal ancestors existing in the kingdom of England that I know that anything going on in the kingdom of England 500 years ago affected enough of my ancestors that that whole history is also my history, right? Wow. I think too, when, when people think about ancestors, they tend to think grandparents, great grandparents, and they think about that, but they don't think about um, your grandparents had siblings and those people had totally. children and those people had children and you have like great, great grand cousins and great, great yeah, grand exactly. uncles. There's all yes. those people, you know, it and, becomes and a web. It's a web. Yes. 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 Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and one thing that I, that we keep kind of skirting around is, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we are creating our world, right? Absolutely. The ancestors created this world that mm -hmm. we are, you know, we're uh, effectively living in a world that was created by those who've gone before us, whether yes. their genealogy matches out, right. or, you know, we're, 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 um, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, genetically connected yes. or not the today is based on what happened yesterday and before and before. Exactly. So then how do we create and continue to create worlds, uh, stories, and legacy, and become ancestor? How do we live better and practice spiritually better or different now to yeah. create and become those who will be once in the past? Because we will then become yes. them. So can we talk a little bit about that? Of course, definitely. That I think I I think that that is a a lot more of an uncomfortable. It's not a complicated answer. It's an uncomfortable answer, which is that we need to learn as much about the context that originated our world now, in order for us to make better decisions about the future that we're creating. And unfortunately, that means that we will come up with uncomfortable history. If family systems theory from a psychotherapeutic point of view has created anything for me, it is this. Families are very, very good at ignoring all of the negative things. Yes. You gave a very good example earlier. You don't know what happened in Italy when your nonna came over. No idea. No idea. Right? A lot of people in the Italian community that I know, their parents came over either after the second world war just before mm -hmm. it because of uncomfortable things connected same yes. with germany same with britain same with many places right yes the new world becomes that place of new opportunity and a fresh start the more people dive into their history the more uncomfortable things will come up i think this is really what's important here is that oftentimes what will happen is one of two things people will shut down and not want to look at it or people will vilify those individuals and those ancestors as being corrupt, evil. I don't want to know about them, right? Mm. And then that's because that's more about your discomfort than necessarily them. We were talking about who was I talking to the other day? I was talking to another podcaster, and uh, and he shared that um, that he his family came over, or one of his ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Oh, and wow. because it's a very I know right I'm not going to say his name but um but he uh he um he found that really cool but what he did find was that in the family the uh because they were good christian folk the idea was that they would never enslave anybody right and then he discovered that one of their ancestors very early ancestors was a slave owner what does he do with that and particularly somebody with a mixed heritage, heritage himself um, wow. well, how, do, how do you work with that right so and the, the story we tell years. ourselves the story we tell ourselves right now i think in in the united states and canada to some degree especially in the united states though 
we're finding situations now where the story that we want to tell ourselves is different from the reality and the reality is actually is what is creating the the future not the story that we're telling ourselves but the story that we're telling ourselves that uncomfortable like in some versions right in some areas um and in some communities the story is i don't want to know about that history because it's too dark it's too uncomfortable for whatever thing right right but it's it's perpetuating it's perpetuating those those issues yeah yeah and and it's it's perpetuating hurt and you know just like internally in a family if there's something that has gone on and everybody's oh we don't talk about you know uncle barry yes. you know we don't because uncle barry is xyz we don't talk about uncle barry now you know it's a secret uncle. now you know it's scary now you're just yeah. you're just allowing it to be and you're not doing anything to stop it right where you exactly. should be able to say hey uncle barry is kind of a pervert and maybe we should call him out on it and then this will stop you know so collectively exactly. like as society we're doing that same thing where we do that within our family structures as well. Totally. And those sort of things get hidden in our ancestry, right? Yes, they get very hidden, much so. right? So, so how do we energetically, spiritually wade through that to become more comfortable with those things and, and understand ourselves and our practices better? It's, it's a complex answer because I think the answer to that depends on every single individual. I think it depends on the, the thing that is making us uncomfortable. I think that is also, um, I think that it also comes down to what our relationship with the ancestors are. Are we keeping those ancestors, for example, slave owners? Now, again, don't come at me. This is just an opinion, but a lot of times I think liberal people tend to want to just ignore that history because it's too dark and they don't want to celebrate those individuals. Very, And that's very fair. We don't want to celebrate individuals who did hurt. But, but in that ignoring, we're actually ignoring the repercussions of that person's life in our world. Mm. And we are we're cutting out a part of our ancestry, right, which is really a part of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so in doing so, we're compartmentalizing, and that's never going to lead anywhere. I think the journey is to be able to, I think the journey is to be able to not accept the repercussion of what that person did, right? But to understand the repercussions of what that person did not throw that person out of the family, but to be able to hold them accountable by then looking at how we are living in the context they created. Mm-hmm. My personal opinion is if we if we um, exile a problematic um, member of the community, of our ancestral community, there is, uh, there's that danger of then compartmentalizing and so then not fully integrating that person back into our lives not understanding okay what are uh, what are some of the problematic pieces here but also what are the light sides of that what are some of the strengths that you live with right Mm -hmm. i'll give a very very good example of that so somebody who uh somebody who grows up with the understanding that their ancestors were plantation owners And they grew up in a context of family business and that the skills and the way of looking at the world and the way of looking at business and opportunity and capitalism in that family business actually originated back with their ancestors who were plantation owners. Now, they would see that as a strength because there's a lot of strengths coming up when you grow up in any culture system, right? In any family system, you're going to have strengths. You're also going to have the reverse of that. So, the shame there is, well, I, I don't want to think about my plantation owner Absolutely. ancestors, right? And you're saying that while still putting your skills that you developed partly because of that history to then good work. Okay. So then it's about bringing those things together, putting everything into context and acknowledging it and be oh, weird. Um, <laughs> that almost never happens. I live in the country, so I don't know what's going on. Um, so it's okay. about integration, but in the same way that shadow work, for example, is about integration. Yes. When you're able to integrate, you're able to then say without shame 
And in that case, particularly, my ancestors were slave owners, and I am not a slave owner, and I don't agree with what they did. But wow, I create. I, I am a product of that history, and therefore, I am going to be walking in this life. Full well knowing that that history is a part of my life, but in understanding to undo that history. And somebody who's British, this this really ties into my own history here. Yeah. When I did my own ancestral work um, five generations ago, I have a, a line in my family that came from Ireland that came over around the same time as the Irish famine. I have a line that comes from Northern Scotland. I have a, a line that comes from Middle England. I have a line that comes from Cornwall and I have a line that comes from Wales. Now, anyone who knows the history of Britain at that time knows that that's the industrial revolution that sucked in people from all the parts of the, of the British Isles yeah. into being effectively not slaves, effectively a, a labor force yeah. to propel um, British imperialism. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that right. was, you know, uh, people were, I mean, dying in mines and, and you know, child labor and, you know, yeah, I, I would say, right. you know, uh, paid labor, but a penny a day is not really paid. But a penny a day, exactly, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and which... all of those lines, well, all of right. those lines are also um, products of English people and the English establishment um, colonizing all of those various different countries in Britain. So in within the colonizing, yes. right? Within me, yeah. I'm a product of that history. If all of yes. that stuff hadn't happened, I wouldn't exist. And a lot yes. of people wouldn't exist. Yes. So what do I do? I then look at how am I decolonizing my practice? Mm. How am I bringing those pieces into my practice and honoring my all of those various in histories together, full well knowing that back when they were all alive in a community, they were all looking down on each other and there was a hierarchical social structure and it was a very negative thing, right? How am I then walking in the world with that? And that's part of that integration piece. I hope that answers that question because well, it's such a big, big it's question. such a big question. It's such a big conversation. Yeah. It's such a big topic. And there's so many little points and like we're almost out of time. Like there's so many Absolutely. little points in there that like I really want to like there you could have a whole another conversation about all of them. Like the fact that you said, you know, it's like shadow work, but it is like shadow work because it's in shadow words, you're taking the parts of yourself, the dark parts, the parts that mm -hmm. that maybe you're embarrassed by or afraid of, you know, those those impulses that you're like, oh, is that really me? Yeah. And guess what? All of your ancestors had those parts as well. So to be able to identify them in your ancestor and in your heritage and go, I'm going to live with this. I'm going to walk with it and I'm going to choose differently. And I'm going yes. to specifically say, well, no, I'm, I'm not this way. Or yeah, maybe there's alcoholism in my line, or maybe there's workaholism in my line. And I'm going to acknowledge that, see how it hurt someone yes. else in that line and yes. actively make the choice to not do that. You know, then there's also the piece of understanding, you know, yeah, we all come from crazy shit. The world has gone through crazy yeah. shit. Your line is colonizers. I don't even know what my line is. You know what I mean? I do joke around with my husband all the time though, because he's um, got, you know, um, Scottish, British, you know, a her heritage on one side of his family. And then we'll go somewhere. I'll be like, well, something will come up and I'll be like, see, your people did that. Your people did that. I mean, the Italians, <laughs> the Italians, we didn't do that. We were too busy drinking wine and eating pasta. We didn't do that. You did that. Your people. Um, and we and we joke around about that. But those things are their things are there and they're real and they inform our lives, our practices. And and you know, I think my takeaway from this entire conversation, Ben, is how understanding and and connecting with ancestral heritage informs our emotional health, our mental health, and our spiritual health, right? Absolutely. To be able to, like you said, integrate these mm -hmm. things to create a fuller understanding of self. And that's really Absolutely. what it is about. And I think lots of magical work is meant to be helping us understand ourselves, how and why we do the things we do so that we can be the better versions of ourselves. At least that's what it is for me. Um, literally Absolutely. could talk to you about this shit for a whole other hour, <laughs> but we can't. 
I know. I, know I really enjoyed this. This is so lit. I'm I'm like jazz. Um. Okay. So the 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 new book, the most recent book, mm -hmm. which is available now, ancestral whispers, whispers, ancestral whispers, whispers, whispers. 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 <laughs> um. Where can people find it? How can people follow you? How can they? I know you book sessions. So how can people book mm -hmm. sessions with you? Tell us everything. Absolutely. Yes, of course. So I actually, um, so as a therapist, I do actually offer, um, I, I am able to take people from the States. I'm able to take people from Canada. I offer uh, ancestral counseling too, which is if somebody is working with ancestral work and, and they want to really focus in on the stuff around that and the trauma that comes up out of that, um, I have a special um, kind of approach with that too. Um, people can go to benstimpson.com. That has all of my uh, all of my stuff on there. I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. I do have a podcast as well. Um, that's now by this time, it'll be our winter session. So there'll be like 50 episodes or something like that on there to enjoy after they enjoy yours, of course. Um, and the book is available on anywhere you can find books. Um, it's on Amazon. People in the States can order it directly from Llewellyn. Um, you can, I often like to say, go to your local independent bookstore too, which is wonderful. Um, and, uh, and most of them will be able to plug in and get these. Um, I believe by this time I will have the uh, some on my website but that'll probably just be a link to go to Llewellyn or somewhere like that so um, but uh, yeah reach out um, email is on my website too um, and I look forward to reaching out and hearing from people too excellent well I'll be stalking you I think I already started stalking you a little bit so uh, now we're besties. Oh, maybe. So, I hope so. so I hope so. so. <laughs> well, we must have because I saw the big uh, post where you put up all the guests that you're going to have. And I was like, oh, look, oh, look at his okay. fancy podcast. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, he's a pro. I can't wait to talk to him. Um, so, okay. Ancestral Whispers by Ben Stimson. Mm -hmm. Buy it wherever you buy books. Go to your local, support local bookstores, support your local witch shops. Just walk in and tell them you want this book and they will order it for you. Okay, exactly. Ben, exactly. last question. Okay. I ask it to everyone. You said that you've been listening and watching, so you should be prepared. <laughs> if you could have me cook you one magical meal as a kitchen witch, what would it be and why? I would want to try your family's version of porchetta. My family's version of porchetta. I don't have yes. that recipe. You don't have that. Oh, I don't. I, I, okay, I, I was making an assumption here. I was having and I was having. I was, have, I was making an assumption. But all now, of my Italian friends, all my Italian friends, and there's only I only have a few of them. But all my Italian friends, they 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 always say, "Oh, my nona's uh, favorite porchetta recipe," and like it's a big thing in Italy. There is different versions of, of yes, porchetta, but yeah. but I don't have a porchetta. But you don't have one. So so there we would be creating legacy. Cause ah, I would have okay. to, I would have to literally call relatives and find out if there is something. Relationship. Well, I'd have to. I wouldn't call the living ones because they're not great. I see. I'd call of on course, the dead ones. Course. Yeah. Right, and I'd be like, "Hey, what do we got?" I would have to come up with that for you. You can claim it too. You can claim it too. What what part of Italy, what part of Italy specifically do you like ascribe your family from? So my my mother's side, my maternal side is from Naples and my paternal side is from Sicily. So we got a lot of okay. and again I I don't know anything about my father's side really. Um I very 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 little. I don't know any like family recipes or anything like that. All of that came from my grandmother on, on my mom's side um, and Nona's pan. So her mother's pan is the pan that I have. It's like oh, I love that. Pan. It's I really love fun. That so much. Um, anyway, I'll have yeah. to come up with a porchetta recipe for you. <laughs> that's, that's just going to have to, really and it'll be in my that. next that's cookbook lovely. and I'll be like dedicated to Ben Stimson. Oh yes, yes, yes. I love Nona. it. I love it. <laughs> ben, thank you so much for being here. This was thank absolutely you. amazing. I could talk to you all night. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really you. appreciate you. This was amazing. Thank you so much. I was looking forward to sitting down with you. So, and I was, this was amazing. I'm looking forward to sharing this um, in 2024. Yes, <laughs> in 2024, this will air in the new year. So um, thank you again so much for being here. Until next time, everyone, I wish you so many blessings and much, much gratitude.